Hi, I'm Tom Giliberto. I'm a meteorologist at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and a master of ceremony here at the U.S. Center for the next two weeks. Welcome uh, to the U.S. Center if this is your first time here. If you don't know what this is, this is a public outreach and diplomacy space organized by the Department of State. Uh, it involves a ton of different events, including a whole variety of people, government, non-government, anything you can think in between. Um, we have a lot of events going on for the next two weeks, so make sure you grab yourself a schedule, or you can go online at state.gov slash US Center for the entire schedule. Uh, for anyone noting here, we actually are live streaming this live, so hello to everyone who is watching online. Um, if you have any questions online, or anyone even here too afraid to say it, by all means, tweet at us. Our uh, hashtag is AskUSCenter. Uh, so please uh, do that. We'll get those questions to you at the very end. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the next event is on how Morocco is advancing clean energy and climate adaptation at home. And our speaker today is Alexandra Haji Vadanovic, who is the regional environmental advisor at USAID Middle East Regional Platform in Frankfurt, Germany. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for, for joining us today. Uh, and I want to just thank for the introduction, but it, the presentation is a bit broader than just Morocco. So I'll be focusing on Morocco, but also in the Middle East and North Africa in general. So it will cover from Morocco all the way to the Levant and Lebanon, uh, West Bank, Gaza, and uh, maybe Iraq as well. And my presentation is not working. OK. So USAID it has a very limited climate change, climate resilience program in the Middle East and North Africa because this is the, the responses that we've gotten from, from the local governments, but we're working right now to improve that. Uh, in Morocco, for example, not to get too far ahead, we're in, in Tunisia, we're implementing a regional drought monitoring system that's modeled after the FUSENET, the famine, famine early warning system that is active in sub-Saharan Africa. I don't know if many of you know that. Uh, the idea of that is to do mapping of, of the groundwater and precipitation levels to, see, to predict drought uh, in Morocco, Tunisia, Lebanon, and uh, Israel. So that's one of our, our biggest projects right now, dealing with climate change. Another activity that USAID is funding in Morocco is to improve irrigation and water resource management in the High Atlas Mountains. And this is something that we are partnering with Coca-Cola uh, and several Moroccan entities and universities to, to be implementing. Uh, two other small activities that are not part of my presentation, we were hoping that the researchers would be here, um, are partnerships and education research grants being done through two Moroccan universities to improve ener renewable energy uses and building efficiencies. One of them is to do um, green energy and photovoltaic cells in university dormitories in Morocco, and the other is for, for housing units. Um, so unfortunately, the researchers can't be here, but I can take questions on it. Um, and I don't have a printout of my slides, so keep going. I'll talk a little bit about, about climate risks in the region. Uh, Morocco, of course, is, is sensitive because of it's an agricultural country. Uh, in Tunisia as well, uh, by mid-century, the wheat growing period is supposed to be shortened by 16 days if there's two degrees Celsius change in, in temperature. Uh, one of the countries that I work in the most and try to convince about the importance of, of climate resilience work is Egypt. Uh, in Egypt, a one meter sea level rise would result in a loss of 13.1% of agricultural area in the upper Nile. Uh, there's also a big risk in, in Egypt due to livelihoods and tourism along the Red Sea. Although the Red Sea is a very resilient body of water, there could be a big loss of tourism and livelihoods because of the dearth of corals. If the water increases too much, the water temperature increases too much, the little bit of tourism that Egypt has right now could be very sorely affected because corals will die. Uh, in Syria, I'm sure many of you know the theory that the current conflict was caused due to famine and drought. Uh, herders lost 85% of their livestock between 2005 and 2010 because of this drought. And there's been several analyses done saying that this is one of the triggers to the current conflict. Uh, 
In Abu Dhabi, which is not a U.S. aid country, but a part of the region nonetheless, uh, a two meter sea level rise would flood 16% of the urban area. So indeed, climate, climate factors are something that should be considered throughout the, the, the region. In Iraq, uh, the, marsh, the marshlands in southern Iraq have been affected by climate change and by disasters and destruction um, based um, you completely threw me off now. Um, okay, so I'll go and talk about drought. <laughs> so, of course, many of the countries, all of the countries in the Middle East and North Africa are dry. This is one of the arguments that, that we have and challenges that we face in saying, yes, climate change will lead to drier and harder temperatures. Many of the governments say it's hot and dry already. So what, what, is, what is drought? The way that drought is being defined by FAO, USAID, and other scientific bodies is multiple dry years. So one year of no rain does not constitute a drought. In Morocco, there has, the country is undergoing a drought right now, and I was thrilled to see yesterday that, that it was raining, though that does not mean the drought is over. Um, uh, and that covers as well Algeria and, and Syria. I, I spoke about uh, how the livestock was lost between 2005 and 2010. Um, there were supposed to be some videos of USAID's work. Uh, can we start that? I'm, now I'm moving ahead and going backwards. So there, I just want to set the, the, thank you, the scenario of what USAID's work in the region is. And that would be through the Our Hands video. أعتقد أن دراسة الماضي هي بداية لانطلاق للمستقبل والحب بنظري هو عطاء العطاء قد ما بتقدر تعطي للآخرين تساعدهم، تساندهم، ترفع الأذى عنهم الفكرة أو الحلم دي على هذا الكاراج هذا اللي كان فكره فيه أنا وأختي هو يكون واحد الكاراج مسني أول حاجة فرانسيس أوتو خلال زراعة الشجر عم طور ناس عم طور سيدات بحب مدرستي كثير وبحب طالباتي كثير انت هذا كيشجع هذا مش يقدر يكمل واحد اخر حتى يوصل للهدف ديالو ممكن كيكونوا جوج خصها كيكونوا قابلين لبعض بياتهم دوك عم توصل شي حاجه اللي هي مزيان بتمنى لهذه الارض سلام الزيتون الشجرات اللي احنا زرعناهم بعد 10 سنين قد ايه بدهم يكونوا بالمستقبل تحت كل شجرة حيصير في قصة preview uh, some of the characters in that in that brief video you'll be seeing uh, with other stories a bit later. Uh, USAID's beyond climate change and uh, adaptation work, uh, USAID in the Middle East also works significantly on democracy, governance, stabilization, education, and um, construction. Uh, I already spoke a bit about the, the drought monitoring system. This is a partnership again with FAO, with ICBA, and the University of Nebraska. And similar to the famine, famine early warning system in Sub-Saharan Africa, this will provide monitoring for, early, for drought. Uh, the idea is to get a lot of this data and Im reduce the impact of drought on food supply and to share it with the, with the local governments um, to improve their uh, disaster risks. USAID also has very, very substantial reforestation activities in Lebanon. Uh, reforestation, as you all know, is restocking of existing forests using native tree planting. Uh, USAID has green, funds greenhouses put seed, to grow seedlings to a mature state, and then they transfer them to, to sites for reforestation planting. Uh, we also are funding reforestation mapping and wildfire management by, with training. Oh. Why do reforestation? Why invest in reforestation? 
uh, wildlife is given a safer habitat, the watershed protection, their CO2 sequestration, which is maybe of particular interest to COP audiences, and you're working with communities to teach them how to protect the forest and be stewards. Uh, one of the biggest advantages of doing this in, in Lebanon, for example, is that you're bringing in a lot of the refugee communities that have come in across from Syria and training them to be stewards because Syria has a similar um, ecosystems as Lebanon. So if some data could go back, they can apply some of the lessons learned in doing this sort of work in Lebanon to, to Syria. Another video, Hoda's Forest. Uh, since 1960, 20% of Lebanon's have, forests have disappeared. I was in Lebanon in February, and it was shocking to see these mountains that have been completely decimated with no forests um, and just, just dry. Hoda in 2013, she's a beneficiary, and she joined a community project to turn the Beka Valley green again. Uh, and we'll see her story now. أنا وعم بركض بحس بالراحة النفسية شعوري لما أركض حد الموقع التحريج اللي أنا ساعدت فيه بحس إنه أنا عملت شيء مميز جدا بحياتي اسمي هدى رعد أنا مدرسة للغة الفرنسية بمتوسطة معنى الرسمية متزوجة من محمد عمار عندي ولدين علي ووليد بحب كتير أقرأ كتب بس أهم شيء عندي الركض هو بالدرجة الأولى وأتكون عم بركض على الطريق وحس إنه نحنا بمنطقة جردة يا الله شو أحلم أتمنى إنه يكون عنا شجر أخضر أركض بين الشجر لاحظت انه لبنان كله اخضر الا البقاع الا منطقتنا وقت اجت الجمعيه حاولنا نحن كبلديه نعمل سايت كذا موقع تحريج بالنسبه للسيدات بيطلعوا معي على السايت بعرفهم كيف طريقة الزرع بحس إنه أنا عم بعمل إنجاز كبير وقت عم يزيد عدد السيدات عندي كل يوم عم يزيدوا عن يوم بدنا يكونوا مش بس مثلي يكونوا أحسن مني تلاميذة يطلعوا يشجروا معي هي مش بس درس على الحيط على اللوح هي لازم تطبقها على الأرض فإذا ما طبقناها على الأرض ما حيعيشوها أجمل شعور إني إجي طلع على الشجرات المزروعين اهتم فيهم حسوا مثل كأنهم عم طلع على أولادي بتخيل هول الشجرات اللي إحنا زرعناهم بعد عشر سنين قد إيه بدهم يكونوا من خلال زراعة الشجر عم طور ناس عم طور سيدات مجرد تغيرت الطبيعة تغيرت النفوس أنا وعم بزرع شجرة عم بحس إنه عم بخلق روح جديدة حياة جديدة حلم جديد بالمستقبل تحت كل شجرة حيصير في قصة One of the great parts about the work in Lebanon is actually that USAID's activities are helping to contribute to Lebanon meeting their targets for the Paris Agreement, uh, which was, I think, an unintended consequence when we first designed this project, because obviously this was before the Paris Agreement happened. Um, for renewable energy, this is, a, uh, this is an area that we're just starting to work on in, in the Middle East and North Africa. 
particularly in Morocco, and I'm very excited to be, to be talking about this. Uh, replacing fossil fuels to reduce uh, dependence on, on, on fuels by photo, photovoltaic. And when I first came to the region, I thought, why is there no, why isn't the whole region covered in, in photovoltaic and solar? Because there's just so much sunshine most of the year. Uh, and I have the answer for that, and maybe some of you do too, but yeah. So curbing climate pollution, improving local air quality, meeting all of those low emission development strategy goals, all of this is a reason that we're supporting renewable energy. In the Middle East, North Africa, this means, of course, solar energy, reforming the electricity sector, uh, put, investing more in photovoltaics, uh, fuel efficient stoves, fuel efficient agriculture. A lot of, we're doing a lot of investments in hydroponics in, in Jordan uh, and, and Lebanon as well. Challenges to using renewable energy. It's very hard for farmers and others to get financing to be put, implementing this in their industries because banks are not comfortable yet. So in some countries, we're working on bank guarantees to allow for financing at the community and local level. There's also the, the question of the ability of the grid to absorb energy produced. And that's something that Morocco is being a leader in with the Warzazat plant, which of course you know is the biggest solar, will be the biggest solar plant in the world. For agriculture and irrigation, this is part of what is called the energy water nexus. Uh, Agriculture in the Middle East and North Africa, of course, is, can be a huge part of the economy. In Saudi Arabia, it's 3.2%. In Egypt, it's 134 And that's a lot of cotton, a lot of tomatoes, wheat. Uh, for large care irrigation in Egypt, for example, it's used for production. It's very hard to allow for energy efficiency for this large scale irrigation. Um, when there's less water, it limits your agriculture potential. Um, where in places where already 90% of water is being used. This is something that USAID in, in Tunisia, for example, is, is working in to improve irrigation and, and how it's used in agricultural production because if pro, the, the theory is if agricultural output goes down, there's less food security, there are less jobs, and that can have a very negative impact on how people, including young people, are employed in places that are volatile and at risks for violent extremism. Uh, in West Bank, Gaza, we, are we have implemented projects to improve agriculture output of olive trees. Uh, and, you can, and here's a sto another story. زراعة الزيتون مع والدي في سنة 1950 كان عمري خمس سنوات ومن يومها وأنا مع الزيتوني ومع مح مع صاحب الزيتوني أنا اسمي خالد حسن حسين ياسين الجنيدي I'm engineer merchant my name is Ayala Noy Meir. I am uh, the owner of the Olive Press and I'm a part of the project uh, Olive Oil Without Borders. For me, it's an uh, opportunity uh, to meet Palestinians, farmers, olive oil producers, people that I never had an opportunity to meet, and talking uh, with the same lab for the same thing. We met uh, four years ago. The first amazing thing was we had to draw each other. You remember? A Palestinian had to draw me, uh, I draw a Palestinian man. And then uh, slowly, slowly we became friends. He gave me a lot of advice how to make a better olive oil. You ask me if there are problems in the oil you have. And so this is very important that we know each other from each other. فمن هون بتيجي هذه العلاقة اللي انبنت علاقة ما كانت موجودة أو أصلاً. In in our village, they found two years ago the most ancient remains of olive oil, eight thousand years old, in jars, big jars, from the Neolithic period. It connects you to to your past, to your future. So olive oil, it's 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 something that you eat, but it's much more. إنه إحنا الفلسطينيين والإسرائيليين عايشين في قطعة صغيرة هالقد صغيرة وبالتالي الزيتوني هون والزيتوني هناك هي نفس الأرض. 
It's hard times. It's very hard for me. But I wish all of us would be like uh, good friends and be understand it. We hope so to be stupid to hate each other. Also our children. Yeah. And to teach our children to be patient. To be it's very difficult. Don't worry. زيتوني غرسون لس رمز السلام في العالم بتمنى لهذه الأرض سلام الزيتوني So the olive oil story is a bit different than the others because what USAID was funding here was improved sanitation product quality for export. We were also funding better irrigation techniques for olive oil and for olive trees. I, I sp spoke briefly already about the efficient irrigation in the High Atlas Mountains activity that is um, actually being launched this week. This is a partnership between Coca-Cola USAID, uh, the Moroccan Biodiversity Livelihoods Association, and um, other groups. We're doing rehabilitation of irrigation canals uh, and enhanced irrigation 10 hectares of land. And it should be benefiting about 2,000 people in, high, in rural communities. The idea is to improve uh, medicinal and aerobatic plant germplasms and output that they can sell and it'll improve their livelihoods. It'll also use less water so that they can plant more with, with less input. This is a new activity that USAID is also funding. Uh, it's the MIT Ultra Low Energy Drip Irrigation Program with the Massachusetts In Institute of Technology at American University. Uh, it will be running from this year to 2019 and it is working with another Indian firm, uh, Jane Irrigation Limited. The plan is to design and, val and validate ultra low pressure drip irrigation systems and they will run on municipal water to reduce the amount of water used in municipal water supply. Uh, this, was, this will be implemented because it will reduce capital costs and improve the amount of water that is coming out with, with less input. The Strawberry King is one of my personal favorites. USAID has been funding hydroponic work in West Bank, Gaza, and now in Jordan for about almost a decade now. Strawberries are very, very, very water intensive crops. Uh, and they also use a lot of pesticide. What USAID is now funding is ways to grow strawberries using less water, less soil, and less to no pesticides. So his story, I mean, I have a picture of this, of the Strawberry King in my office. This is really a story that I think is wonderful. And when I've gone to visit sites in, in Jordan, it's incredible to see the output for, and the quality of strawberries that are having to meet EU regulations and requirements because Jordan is using this for, for exports. Uh, and the, the farmers working on strawberries, both in, for, for Osama's example and in Jordan, are inviting students to come in and learn about these methods because they're not often being taught in university. But it's something that when these agronomists graduate, they can bring to, to their practices wherever they go. أنا اسمي أسامة محمد ياسين الرب عندي بنت اسمها حنين وزوجتي ازدهر وإحنا مزارعين التوت الأرضي طبعا هاي الأولاد نعمة من الله مبسوط فيها كثير أنا كنت من الناس الأوائل اللي جربوا و أدخلوا تجربة زراعة التوت الأرضي على بالضفة الغربية هلا عندي أنا مزرعة الفراولة نكلنا زراعة الفراولة من الزراعة التقليدية الأرضية 
ساعدونا اليو اس ايد بنظام الراي جهاز الكمبيوتر يعني ثلاث دونمات بنتجن اكثر من 30 دونم بطريقه تقليديه هلا انا عم بدرس في الجامعه سنه ثالثه بدرس وبتابع دراستي باستمرار صاحباتي دائما بيجوا عنا على المزرعه يعني اكثر من مره في الفصل فهذا الشيء بتعلموا منه بيكتسبوا الخبره من والدي المشترين اللي اللي بيشتروا الفراوله المنتجة عنا من المزرعه بيميزوها لعده اسباب جودة الثمار وحلاوتها وحلاوة المنظر والشكل بحب في والدي اشياء كثير مميزه اللي هي مثل انه حنيته فلما هو بحط هذا قدامه بوصل ومبسوط جدا وتخصصت في مجال الزراعه تدرس هندسه زراعيه طبعا انا عندي استعداد اني احقق لك طموحك شو ما كان بالنسبه للدراسه الفراوله بالنسبه لي يعني بحبها من داخلي من 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 قلبي من جوا يعني <تصفيق> So again, I think this is this is the part of the present. I'm, I'm done with my presentation, so I hope to get questions from you and, and start a dialogue. Um, this is an area, climate change, adaptation, mitigation is an area that USAID, like I said, unfortunately has not been so active in, in this region. And I'm looking forward to, to have us having work a bit more, supporting the countries and engaging a bit more on how to do some more resilience work and address vulnerabilities. So I'm happy to take questions. I'll come with the microphone. All right, in the back. With the many projects that are out there, how does USAID prioritize among them and choose the ones that they're going to fund? So all the all of the pro I'd say seventy percent of the projects I just mentioned I, that I just talked about are all funded centrally from the from Washington, not from the bilateral missions, and that's because of the applications that come to us. And there isn't that many applications. There aren't that many applications that come to us. Uh, the bilateral programs in the individual countries, they have their own way of selecting. That's usually done based on a strategic development of what the focus is in that country. So for example, Jordan was doing a lot of work in water conservation and agriculture, or they were planning to. And that has now pivoted to support refugees communities in the north. So it, it depends on what the individual bilateral priority is at any given time. Thank you. Oh, I'll do one here and then right here. Yes, my question is, um, as you know, uh, USAID funded the first uh, wind turbines mm -hmm. uh, in Morocco. Mm -hmm. And Morocco has about the, probably the cheapest wind generation cost in the world and has a wind turbine on its 100 dirham currency note. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So my question is, within the whole region, uh, what do you think are likely to be the, the projects and items that may end up in, uh, in the currency notes? That's a great question. Uh, if there was a regional currency, let's say, like in, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna go creative with, with your question. If there was a regional question, currency, like a euro, I think the sun. I think that solar energy is where there's the biggest possibility and potential. The biggest risk with solar, I have been explained many times when I say, why isn't the whole you know, desert covered in, in photovoltaic, is the dust. There's thin layers of dust and this will reduce the, um, the amount of solar that can be taken in. But for example, in Jordan, when I brought this up, they said, easy, we, job development, people go and clean them, no problem. So I think if we're talking writ large a lot across the region, I think it would be solar. Not everyone is gifted with wind. Not everyone would want to take the risk on hydroponics. Um, we were trying to advocate for hydroponic systems in Yemen which is extremely water um, insecure. 
and the, the cost of introducing hydroponic in Yemen was very, very, very high, given that most of the water is being used by, with cot, and the U.S. government cannot fund um, water-efficient cot. So solar, I would say solar to answer your question. Uh, Ayub Ibn Fasih, uh, reporter in uh, a magazine called uh, in, here in Morocco, Economie Entreprise. Uh, so my question will be, uh, what, are, what are the, the main projects uh, funded by the U.S. aid uh, here in Morocco? Thank you. So I, I, would, I would defer to, to my bilateral mission colleagues on this. I think from what I know, and please step in, uh, U.S. aid in Morocco is working mostly on education and uh, democracy and governance projects and some economic growth, but I would defer to the bilateral. I work at the regional level, but I think, I know that there's several education projects. Um, I think higher, higher education, basic education. But yeah, do you wanna? Hi, my name is Clara McLinden and I represent USAID Morocco. Um, to answer your question, we have three main sectors that we work in, uh, economic growth, democracy and governance, and education. Um, economic growth, it, we have a wide, wide range of projects that we do within that sector, um, but it's pri our primary focus for this current strategy is all about youth opportunity. Um, so I'd be happy to discuss this with you further offline, um, but that's the basic idea for economic growth. For education, it's primarily basic education, so improving uh, reading skills in early grades, and democracy and governance, we work very closely with civil society to try to increase the connection between uh, citizens and uh, responsive government on a local level. So thank you very much for your uh, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, most of uh, uh, environmental risk in the region are regional and mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. natural. Mm -hmm. However, in your presentation, you only focused on local or domestic issues. Mm -hmm. uh, is uh, USAID interested in promoting regional projects regarding these environmental uh, risk or not? And uh, yeah. for example, which projects or, or, uh, or areas that might be uh, attractive? I would say absolutely, absolutely. I think tran transboundary issues are one of our biggest challenges and also weaknesses. Um, unfortunately, the US government cannot work in a lot of countries across the borders because of the sec security situations. So for example, the High Atlas project is working actually between Morocco and Tunisia, so that's transboundary. Um, we're about to fund work in between West Bank, Gaza, Israel, and Jordan for the Red Dead Canal, for example. Um, it's very hard to do stuff trans-border with Libya. It's just the situation is not, isn't secure enough. Same with Syria. Uh, Lebanon and Jordan work together some, but it, it's very difficult right now to be doing much transboundary work. I'm proud of the work in Morocco and Tunisia with the High Atlas because it's doing, it's crossing borders. But you're absolutely right. The regional work is, is necessary, but it's just the, sec the security situation right now makes it difficult for us for us to be working in, in that way. Hi, thanks a lot for your presentation. Um, how does exactly the application process work for projects, let's say in Morocco or the MENA regions to uh, the central US in Washington? Uh, the, the solicitations, as we call them, are, are posted on a website called grants.gov. And so when, when, the, when the bilateral missions or the, the regional office comes up with, with a new activity and needs solicitation, it'll be posted on grants.gov. So it's just a matter of, of you checking periodically um, what's coming online. Hi. Uh, hello. Okay, uh, I'm from Jordan. My name is Musa. I'm the Commissioner General for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. And I can testify to, you refer to my country a lot, but yeah, I, I can testify to your role, the role of USAID in the country in many respects. But my question is, as a human rights activist, uh, 
here, and I'm just uh, looking at how human rights issues are here in this conference are uh, reflected. Or I would like to ask you to what extent that the USAID is really feels feels satisfied about the human rights dimension in its, uh, in its projects in Jordan or uh, worldwide. Yeah. Well, I, I can't speak specifically to Jordan because, like I said, I work at, at the regional basis. Uh, I, there's certain analyses that we have to do for, for our projects, and unfortunately, human rights considerations are not one of them. Uh, we do sustainability, we do gender, we do youth, we do environment, and perhaps the human rights element could be seen through gender or youth, but there is no requirement right now to do human rights analyses or considerations as such. With that said, I would hope that USAID's programming in Jordan or elsewhere in the region is sensitive to human rights issues. I know that we, we put a big emphasis on making sure that women are empowered, so that that's one human rights dimension, but I know I'm, I'm, I'm married to a human rights lawyer. I know that that's not the only dimension in human rights, so I'm sorry I don't have a better answer. But. Any more questions out there? Anyone? Any more questions? I do have one question. Um, I actually used to work for FuseNet. Um, I'm curious about the ways you're dealing with, the, is there training involvement as well in that program in terms of uh, emergency managers on the ground as, as well as dealing with local communities and drought and, and, and how that works? There will be, there will be. So the project actually just launched last month. And right now, USAID FAO and the International Center for Biosaline Agriculture are hosting their focus groups in each of the countries to figure out what the needs are. But yes, training is envisioned. And hopefully sometimes in the next few years, that'll get underway. Hi, thanks for the, for the presentation and the movies. I wanted to know, you mentioned the drought tool early on or the drought seasonal drought forecast, and I was wondering how people on the ground in the region perceive changes in drought. Do they view it as just something that happens? Is it, a, is it something that they see in either increasing in frequency or severity? They connect it to the climate change issue or not? I think generally people see, sorry, um, people are seeing some climate variability. Um, Again, gentleman from Jordan can attest to this. There's been snowstorms, there's been blizzards in Jordan and Saudi Arabia. So you say, oh, look, there's, there's rain, there's precipitation. But actually, it's very little. It's a couple of centimeters, just that it expands when it's snow. Um, so drought is seen as something that, yes, is cyclical, but has gotten worse, and it's lasting longer. Uh, and that's affecting crops. So the answer is yes to both, to both questions. Yes, um, I'd like to fall back on the High Atlas uh, project. If, if you could let us know why uh, Algeria, because it's a regional project, what was the main criteria for not including Algeria in this project? USA does not work in Algeria. <laughs> I, would I would have loved if Algeria was included, but USA does not have um, a presence in Algeria. All right, any other questions we have out there? Do you want to run the last video yes, then? Yes, please.
and I'm around afterwards if you have any, any questions you want to take offline. Let's give Alexandria a round of applause. And thank you all for coming to the U.S. Center. We still have uh, plenty of other events on the schedule today. It's from 3 to 3.30. We have a NASA Hyperwall talk. From 3.30 to 4, we have an Innovation Corner talk. And from 4 to 5, we have the last side event here on the main stage, uh, looking at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, State of the Climate and Climate Data Services. Basically, if you're interested in climate data and products that use those data, you'd want to come